all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette de Vidar. Sustainably forward, our topic tonight. Good evening and welcome to Smart Sustainability on this February 13, 2022. I'm Nicolette de Vidar. February is traditionally an interesting month of transitioning. It's the shortest month of the year, very often the coldest, depending, of course, on where you live. And between the busy season of the birth of the light, celebrated as Christmas and the holidays, and January, the month of new beginnings, February is the transitioning time before spring. House cleaning time, in a way. It has certainly that ring of cleansing to it. And indeed, February, the word, was named after the Roman festival of purification called Februa, during which people were ritually washed, cleansed, purified. Today, we certainly have some cleansing moments in our lifetimes, moments of clarity, understanding, of expression and celebration. We have Valentine's Day just coming up. We honor achievements of our leaders with President's Day and it is Black History Month. In brief, it's a month where many facets of our lives and social interactions are coming together. And when we look around, those moments of clarity certainly are gaining speed. Up north in Canada, for example, in Europe and also in other parts of the world. People are tired from the COVID policies and the restrictions that have been maintained despite the fact that the beginning narrative has crumbled. As a result, we see Canadians standing up for their rights in a protest that Canada has never seen. Europeans are standing up for their rights on a daily basis as well. And we see it also in the United States. People are not only getting tired of the COVID narrative, but they're waking up to the inconsistencies and illogical actions many governments are taking, prompting many of us to reconsider our elected choices and dive deeper into what democracy actually means and is and what it is not. For two years, most of us have done our part. We stayed home, we quarantined, we wore masks, we listened to what leaders said, and even if you didn't believe in it, we would often comply just to make others around us feel more comfortable. We got vaccinated, many of us, boosted, we spent money on tests, we stopped seeing our families, we stopped celebrating birthdays and put our lives on hold. Our children paid a heavy price for that, all in the name of science. The consequences of this entire COVID exercise are still revealing themselves as we go forward. At this point, the government narratives are so badly crumbling that by now it becomes more and more a question of showing their true colors, like Justin Trudeau in Canada and Olaf Scholz in Germany. We've seen countries that have already had their freedom days, Denmark, Sweden, for example, the UK, Ireland, Spain, Switzerland, and we see others that are still debating about vaccine mandates, such as Germany, based on a possible speculative future variant with vaccines that have proven to be effective only to a very narrow point of view versus the actual situation. We've seen studies like the Johns Hopkins study that revealed that the lockdowns had such a small impact, preventing only 2% from the COVID impact, while the other cost, economic cost, mental health problems, destruction of livelihoods were much worse and much higher. Add to this that Omicron served as the disruptor who shook the entire government narrative to the core. Understandably, people want their freedoms. The question becomes why do governments then still hold on to a narrative that simply doesn't make sense anymore and what is a sustainable way forward. So instead of adjusting and going with the flow, governments like the Canadian one under Justin Trudeau and Olaf Scholz in Germany are doubling down, making them more and more look out of touch with science, out of touch with reality, disconnected from the people and more and more acting like tyrants. 
When you look at the past three weeks, one could see that terms like fascism, socialism, capitalism, democracy were thrown around like they're all interchangeable, really showing that these words, for most of them, have no meaning and no clarity of what is actually what. As a native German with Jewish, Sudeten and German roots, born literally at the border of East and West, I'm getting a bit annoyed by these comparisons and the hijacking of history, and I'm not alone. Fascism isn't just a group of people in boots and uniforms. Socialism isn't just everyone being treated equal, as the idea might suggest to some. And democracy isn't just groups of people following the same view. In fact, it's the opposite. Democracy is creating room for all kinds of views, even if you disagree. But that says something many of the leaders today in the Western world have issues with. So perhaps their understanding of democracy isn't quite up to par. And that's the danger with the times we're in. As Guido Westerwelle, former foreign minister of Germany, once said, the danger for democracy doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come from politicians. It comes when citizens no longer have their own immune system that should act as a shield when freedom is endangered. That couldn't be any truer today. We've lived in peace for so long that we all took our rights for granted, and those of us who've been through a time when they had to fight for their rights are perhaps a bit more vigilant than others. I think this is where a lot of misunderstandings come from today. It's hard to detect patterns when you've never been in a situation where such a pattern was previously experienced. That's why history is really important beyond face value. Not just looking at Nazis as people in uniforms, but understand the underlying essences that factors that made it possible for them to rise and get into power in the first place. Here's a saying that says, freedom always dies in tiny steps. So with February being a month of purifying honor and achievement, we wanted to do a different show tonight <clears throat> and capture some of the things we, we need so we could actually sustainably move forward. So going forward always needs a few pieces. We need healing, we need recognizing, we need acknowledging before we get into our own power and we need a different approach. So in this segment, in the first segment, we want to start with honoring Black History Month and coming together as people. We have a lot of stories to share and we've done some episodes that we want to share with you. And then in the other segments, we have a few guests that actually will join us. I have Richard Kunicki, who sits in Canada, who's also an underwriter of, the, uh, of a United Nations petition to make the planet sustainable for a sustainable way forward. We also have James Fuller, who actually joins us from a vessel in the Gulf of Mexico, who is also an underwriter of that United Nations petition. And we have Signe Miranda, also in Canada, who um, is quite there and, and connected to seeing what's going on with the truckers to actually give us an update. So let's start in this first segment. I would like to play a video first and honor Black uh, February as uh, Black History Month because I think it's really important and then give you a few clips of the shows we've done over the year which had to do a lot with Black History and our understanding of that. Let's start with that. We can go straight to the second video because I have sort of piled up a few clips for you of some of the, of the topics we talked about that have to do with the Black History Month and also the history and how we progress during the course of life. 165 years, that's a oh. long time when you really think about this. So let me ask you, how do you feel about Juneteenth finally having become a federal holiday? I'm going to start Actually, with I was very excited about it because it moves it to a different level. Now everyone mm -hmm. will have an opportunity to celebrate. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So there's no working, there's no banks open. Mm -hmm. But it gives also an opportunity for people to really learn more about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. You know, before uh, I think all but four states, and to include DC, was actually celebrating Juneteenth, mm -hmm. but not at the level that I think it will be celebrated now. Mm -hmm. But I think now more people will actually try to learn more because I was looking at the stats. Mm -hmm. you know, so they will right. learn more about Juneteenth. And now we can plan for bigger celebrations the same as we did with, the f we do rather, with the 4th of July. Yeah. You know, so yeah. this, is, this is celebrating the black community, the abolishment of slavery mm -hmm. in 1865. Yep. I'm excited that it is has become a holiday. My hope and prayer is that we use it as an educational tool. Our story must be told. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it took so long for everyone who was enslaved to even find out <laughs> that they were free says a lot. It's unfathomable, I can't even say that word, um, to even understand that concept that you were still working and you were free. Hmm. So that message has to be told. Our story must be told. And I'm so grateful that now it can be told. I think that Juneteenth becoming an actual federal holiday is a good thing, but I mean, make no mistake about it, African Americans have always celebrated this holiday. Mm -hmm. Many African Americans yeah. have celebrated this holiday. Yep. It actually becoming a, a federal holiday does thrust it into the spotlight and makes other people who may not have been aware of the holiday mm -hmm. now aware, mm -hmm. but it can't be just a, a pacifier. Is it really a step toward uh, reconciliation and healing. Yeah. I'm not so sure of that. Um, you know, there are many atrocities from the past that have to be answered for, such as redlining. So mm -hmm. it is a little bit a wider approach to that, to shaking it up, so to speak. Well, I think that the approach as we have, uh, our eyes have been opened in 2020 is that we have to represent, I think, a larger number of our minority communities and um, people of color in terms of listening to their voices, making sure they're included in the decision making process, mm -hmm. whether it's in healthcare, education, or it's actually those who may even in fact run local government. Allowing those citizens to be a part of the decision making process. How are you giving them full access to resources? You know, uh, those are the discussions that cities are grappling with. And a lot of times it requires, particularly in areas where you have minor a majority uh, uh, individuals that control resources, et cetera, how do you uh, get them to have a willingness to allow those individuals to be part of decision making, but more importantly, uh, to understand the, the value and the richness of diversity and inclusion in their community, uh, because if you have those diverse voices, you're better off in the end. Yeah, these were a few clips, and I actually do want to let you know, of course, our viewers, that um, we do want to collect more stories, actual stories of what happened to you, what you went through, um, and to really celebrate the, the Black History Month, to learn more about the history, to learn more about each other, because I really think right now we're at a point where it has to come all together. It's really, really important. So we've, we've talked during the last year, there was a lot of healing, or trying to get to healing, a lot of understanding of sort of where where is the past, where does the past meet the present? And then now with COVID and with all developments, with the restrictions, we're all being sort of fast forwarded to an area where suddenly it's, 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 there's another component that's been introduced and that's really is no more a question of left or right or no more a question of black and white. And of course, there's still a lot of advancement to do. But now we suddenly find ourselves in, it's more like the, the fight for freedom versus the fight for giving in to a technocrat or a government controlled uh, life going forward. So that actually talking about diversity and inclusion and this whole idea of bringing all the people into the community 
Now to contrast that with Canada, along comes Justin Trudeau, who says that he actually has no tolerance for anyone with different views than his. So the fringe minority with unacceptable views. In fact, many of us are actually part of those with unacceptable views. And I think for democracy, that's really a very, very dangerous component because a democracy is built on opposite views, on a number of different views, not just one. So I want to switch a little bit gears here and go to Canada and <clears throat> call on Richard and Signy and g give us an update in what's happening there. Hi Nicolette, thanks for having us on the show. Hi Nicolette, hi James, great to see you. It's a real pleasure to be back on your show, Nicolette. Thank you very much for having us. I'll let Signy start off, I think. Well, it, it's, it's a really interesting time that we're going through right now with uh, people believe that we're in a democracy, but mm -hmm. when the regulations are being put in place that are against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is part of our Constitution, and when things are being put in place by the government that also go against the human rights codes, it's, it's a really shocking thing to experience. And with the mainstream media siding with the government, a lot of people in our country believe what the media says, believe what the government says, oh, it's for our best interests. They're protecting us by, by limiting our rights. And that's why we're speaking up and we're realizing it's important to share what's really going on with people. Yeah, I totally agree. And actually, when you looked at the footage, I know there's there's on, on mainstream media, there is no footage out on this one. When you actually look on Twitter and on more independent media, there's a lot of footage out in terms of what's going on in Canada, how people are celebrating, etc. And then, of course, the government called them all uh, racist, misogynist. Um, it's, it's really quite shocking to me as a German. I will say that has been particularly shocking and it's, what's even more shocking is that everybody always sort of plays the Nazi card. We're tired of it because that's not what it is. The Nazis are usually those who point the fingers to others. That's where you find the Nazis. And that's sort of with the history where people really have to get sensitized for. Can you give us a couple more examples, Signy, in terms of what you mean, how the rights actually have clamped down? Because what we hear on the media is they unlawful protests, they are a few people, they racists, etc. Now give us the specs. Well, one of the things that's happening is it's different, a little bit different in each province. So there's one province in Eastern Canada where people who are unvaccinated are not allowed to go into grocery stores mm -hmm. and buy and buy food in the grocery stores. I believe they've left it up to the grocery stores to decide if they'll follow that or not. Um, people who are unvaccinated are not allowed to go into gyms. They're not allowed to eat in restaurants. They're not allowed in movie theaters. They're not allowed to play sports. And they're doing this for teenagers as well who are over 16. They have to be vaccinated. I believe they brought it down to 12. Um, if they're not vaccinated, they can't participate in sports either. And there's mask regulations everywhere. They have everybody vaccinated, but they still but they still need to make you wear masks. So they brought in the vaccine passports. The federal government decided to leave it up to the provinces, but they they said they'd give them money to implement the vaccine passports. So they're basically paying the provinces to implement these measures. So they're responsible for it instead of the federal government actually mm. doing it. Mm. Now, Canadians have the reputation of being a very peaceful nation, actually. So when you look at what's going on, all the people on the street, um, it is now, what, the 15th day in Ottawa. How, what is your reaction to that? Are you surprised? You know, at first we were wondering why people were protesting all around the world, hundreds of thousands of people, <laughs> in some cases a million people, people in France and Australia and all over the world and wondering why it wasn't happening in Canada with us having some of the, the harshest restrictions in the world with yeah. the exception of Australia. And, and then finally when this, um, this trucker convoy went across the country, people jumped on board with, with speaking up about how they didn't support the mandates either. So they're not necessarily uh, part of what the leaders of the Congo are doing, but it's, it's bringing everybody out who doesn't agree with what's going on.
Yeah, and actually there is like, you know, I, I, I thought 90% of the truckers, they are actually vaccinated. It's a pretty high number though, isn't it? That's true, it is. So it's, it's a small percentage of the actual truckers who are part of the protest. But I believe um, from some of the posts that I've seen and some of the interviews, uh, some of the truckers who are vaccinated are also in alignment with speaking out against the mandates. And a lot of citizens who are vaccinated, they don't agree with the segregation that's happening because the, the government has created a segregated society by telling the unvaccinated the vaccinated to be afraid of the unvaccinated and tell, trying to pit, pit the two sides against each other and create division within the country. Yeah, and, and I think people aren't standing for that anymore. We, we see that too. When you look back um, in the past year, what were the most shocking moments for you as a Canadian to see sort of what had happened to Canada? Want to speak to that? Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I like to me, one of the most uh, shocking moments was in Parliament earlier this week, um, where Prime Minister Trudeau was being asked a series of questions, and he walked out of Parliament. And I mean, if, if, if your leader, or if the leader of your country kind of turns around and says, well, the heck with you, and walk out of Parliament, why should we, the citizens, even pay attention to what he? Why don't we all just walk out on him? And I think that's what the uh, uh, the trucker strike is bringing. It's bringing not only awareness in Canada and support in Canada. We are having a peaceful, uh, a peaceful revolution, if you want to call it that. But it's a freedom rally for the fact that we've had our rights violated and taken away. Yeah. And all of people are actually taking the time out of their daily livelihoods to come and support the rest of Canadians. And I'm really proud to say that that uh, example is now being carried out all around the world. It's so exciting to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned something that I find also very poignant, and you said a peaceful revolution. I find from looking at, you know, many of the independent media accounts for looking at the social media in terms of what's going on in Canada, <clears throat> the atmosphere there actually does remind me a lot of what happened in East Germany when the wall came down in the weeks before the wall came down in 89 and I actually pulled some footage which I would like to share as a reminder for some people maybe you it's it's something you have not been so familiar with or so but it really shows when people come together how powerful a, a nation or people can be. So I do want to play that clip um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. On the 9th October 1989, the in Leipzig. Both the army and paramilitary organizations are on standby. Will they quell the peaceful revolution by the GDR citizens with force? Socialism is not on trial here, but the people want freedom, a better GDR. The protest had started in the Nikolai Church. They became known as the Monday Demonstrations. We all knew that the Beijing solution was a possibility. Only a few months before, student protests in communist China had been terminated by force. And with this feeling, 70,000 people went into the city. They were fueled by this despair, this fear, and a feeling of hopelessness. This was the only way, either them or us. Just two days earlier, on 7th October 1989, the 40th anniversary of the founding of the GDR, police had forcefully beaten demonstrators in East Berlin, even though Western camera teams were there to document everything. What will happen in Leipzig on the 9th of October? Naturally, of course, we were constantly thinking that they had used force in Berlin, so why wouldn't they do that here in Leipzig? There's no one here to document this. There are a few telephone lines to Berlin, but that's it. This is going to be the biggest Monday demonstration that has taken place in Leipzig so far. A prominent Leipzig resident urges reason 
both citizens as well as the state. Our common worries and responsibilities have brought us here together today. We are concerned about the developments in our city and are searching for a solution. We all need the chance of a free discussion about the future of socialism in our country. We urge you to remain level-headed to enable a peaceful dialogue. This is Kurt Mazur speaking. Then for those who heard it, probably found it helpful to stay calm. I'm sure they weren't relieved. They still had to walk the whole way past the building of the security forces, the town hall, places where they couldn't really expect any help. But instead, confrontation. The fact that the demonstrations remain peaceful is down to the behavior of Leipzig citizens who give the police and paramilitaries no reason to intervene. And Berlin stays quiet. I was relieved. We danced when we had walked along the ring road for the first time on the 9th of October. It was a great atmosphere. I said, this is the evening our parents have been waiting for, that we could march past them like this. And we did it. But it is a miracle. This is what we do. The 9th of October, 1989, a day of decision. Four weeks later, the wall comes down. And actually, what they were saying at the beginning, you know, we are sent as folk, meaning we are the people. And I think this is something that's definitely going forward. They also talked about the Monday demonstrations. And we heard before from our guests here that, <clears throat> you know, there are so many people in Europe also going on the street. Yes, the Monday demonstrations in Germany are actually back on again and last Monday on February 7 over 1 million people in 2,300 cities across the country went on a march. Let me show you the clip so you see what it's like and that people go on the, st on the street, they take it to the street.
I wanted to share that with you because these things never make it on national media, but it does tell you that people are standing up. And while before in East Germany we heard that the Western media was actually documenting everything, yes, because at the time they had an interest that the East, East was going to fall, now the mainstream media, you're not hearing much about the protests in Canada or about the protests in the rest of the world because they don't have an interest in it. The independent media are the ones who report and I think the more people actually know what's going on and see how citizens document everything that's happening, the more we understand that this isn't a time to sit it out anymore. It really isn't. So I want to come back here to Canada here a little bit. I, I wanted to play that because really to me there's such a stark reminder of that time versus also now for your right because this isn't anti anti vaccine or something this is really about something much much bigger what understanding of democracy do you think do canadians in generally have or had before this all evolved richard you want to take that or signy yeah no i i have to take that i mean um i think first and foremost is leadership around the world has crumbled dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, no, um, there, there's no similarities. Every leader's got a different picture. Uh, this last week, we had four provinces of Canada that uh, dropped all or most of the mandate. So uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Prince Edward Island, and Quebec. Quebec. Um, and yet, here we are in Ontario, the largest populace, um, and of course, uh, our, our provincial leader uh, is asking us to continue to stay with lockdowns and stay with all of these different things uh, well into March or April. It seems like a never-ending end for the Canadian people, but we believe that uh, slowly but surely there are more people that are showing up and, and quite frankly, I'd like to see, uh, you know, another 25,000 trucks uh, in <laughs> Ottawa. I'd love to see another 10,000 trucks there. I'd like to see 10,000 trucks in Toronto. And I'd like to see them put in strategic places that people will notice. And I think that's what's happening now. People are noticing. People are starting to recognize what's going on. And I think there's a lot of people who really are not accepting of the fact, but they don't know what to do. And I think that's one of our biggest issues at this point in time is who do we follow? If somebody's broken the law or, or changed the rules, then if those are accountable measures, then that's fine. But if they are against our human rights and our freedoms and our privileges that many people have come and immigrated to Canada since uh, the Second World War anyway, and ultimately, at the end of the day, they believe in democracy. And I'm surprised that the, our, our definitions of democracy aren't being protected to the degree that, as an example, my parents who were POWs mm -hmm. um, they came here because they wanted to uh, have a wonderful life and have their rights and freedoms uh, recognized and, and have a comfort zone that those weren't going to be taken away. And I think a lot of this is going to really continue to grow. I don't think it's over yet, and uh, I don't think it's over for uh, for some time because what we're asking for is no different than what anybody else, it seems, around the world is asking for. So power to all of us people who <laughs> want to grab back our change and reclaim our rights. Oh, absolutely. And I think people really are waking up to the fact that the power is with the people and you have to, you really have to take a stand. Um, it's important. But what I find so interesting, and I've, I've seen that in the footage we got from Germany, and I've seen that in footage we have from Canada, which we're going to play in a moment. It's really people from all walks of life. So this entire narrative, how can actually someone like Justin Trudeau go up there and say, oh, they're all racist, when you see Every demographics is participating in those marches. 
I mean, how can you even stand out there with a straight face and say that? You must be so disconnected from reality or so um, entrenched in your own lie that you cannot see anything that's happening anymore. So I do want to go ahead and see if we can play another clip. I know I had one from Paris where there was another demonstration today and I had a few from Canada just to show a little bit more like who's actually going out there. People have to unite, no question about that. So I found you also told me a story, Signe, in terms of what happened to people who have who are willing to go on a protest, for example. So we see a lot of measurements by the government where they're actually changing the rules, so to speak, right in the middle of the game, right? Exactly. And one of the things that happened in the last few days is our premier declared a state of emergency so he could have the protesters from Ottawa removed and the protesters from the bridge between the U.S. and Canada, the Peace Bridge at Windsor. And, and Coots. Yes. And I, I saw somebody post on Facebook, watch out, the, the government is looking at your Facebook pages. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I don't see any evidence of that yet. So I took it with a grain of salt. And then later that day, there was a woman who posted a video on Facebook of an OPP officer showing up at her farmhouse in Peterborough because she saw a comment that she posted in a Facebook group about considering going to the protest. And the OPP officer, the Ontario Provincial Police Officer, showed up at her door and gave her a pamphlet about what you can and can't do at a protest and said, I just wanted to let you know if you happen to be going to a protest, that you'll do it peacefully. And then she left. So it, it's shocking that, that the police are spending all this time and effort monitoring, monitoring people's uh, social media posts and people who aren't necessarily even actively protesting, people who are considering protesting as a preemptive measure. So the government is really taking a stronghold on things and doing everything they can in their power to try and convince people that what they say is right and what they say is the best thing and that if you have an opinion that's different than theirs, you should be afraid of them. Actually, and, uh, Trudeau went further than that. He said he doesn't want to tolerate those people with a different opinion. Absolutely. And I remember a, a CBC post that I saw. It was a CBC article. So that's the, the, Canadian, um, the Canadian public broadcasters. And they posted um, in this commentary section, if you give the government an inch, they'll take a mile. It was something to that effect. And we were kind of surprised that a mainstream media would actually criticize the government like that and it was great to see but then we haven't really seen anything in the mainstream media like that since they've been more in alignment with the government yeah you know that's the thing i find very often when you look at um how how these these uh, regime changes happen or work there is a small window when one can actually stand up but at some point that window closes and at that point it becomes too late for standing up because then it becomes too dangerous you get punished you get imprisoned you go to places where you really don't want to end up and things like that so for citizens and that's the part where our own immune system really needs to function it's kind of like when to knowing when do you when are you past the line of what's actually normal and a, a good and and, and uh, a, a meaningful measure that actually makes sense for the collective and where are you losing your rights and we go over you know where, where the system tips and sort of you you go into the danger zone because that's a really small window that's open for people to stand up we do have that facebook clip i wonder if we can play it let's see if we we have it because i thought that's really quite intimidating if somebody suddenly shows up and if you're planning to go on a on a protest and suddenly the police knocks at your door well how many people do you think are going to be deterred something on my Facebook? No, on the Facebook group. Okay. And 
decided to come to my personal residence to give me information about peaceful protest? Yes. Okay, so are the Peterborough police... No, you're with... I think this can be called as subtle intimidation of actually sort of deterring protesters from or citizens from taking their rights and standing up for their rights. This is something that you've seen in East Germany in a little step further ahead and, and other uh, countries where this has happened in the past. So if this doesn't give you a pause to think about your stand, then I, I don't know what else will actually wake you up. I will say that. Um, <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about why do you think there is actually this, this whole push? Where's the connection? Because there seem to be a few leaders who are all in the same pot. They have the same doubling down approach. They have the same, kind of like they come out of the same cotter, if you want. So where do you think this is coming from, Richard? I know you've, you've looked around a little bit on this one. Well, you know, N Nicolette, I really try to speak nicely about people, but <laughs> when you have somebody who is running a country and really putting all the money in their pocket um, with regards to taking it away from the rest of the citizens. So when, when we have things like that that are going on, and these are being exposed by many people, for example, um, I don't know how many people who are uh, protesting or not protesting, perhaps more specifically, but do they know anything about the World Economic Forum Young Leaders Group and what these people are being groomed to do? And Trudeau happens to be a part of that group. And quite frankly, um, the people who run the group have no real, uh, let's put it this way, no real vision in the context of who they are in Canada. These are not people who are uh, 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 voted into the positions that they want to make changes and things of that nature. These are just the, the, the bullies of the earth who are just trying to tell us this is what you're going to do and you're going to like it. And unfortunately, that's the attitude that's been adapted by our prime minister. And this is not something that you can't find on YouTube or you can't find it on various other places to have simple proofs that the government and the leadership of Canada is not being ethical. And if they're not being ethical, they should have, potentially speaking, charges against the individuals. And you know what? Let's move them off the center stage. Let's get these people off the block so that we can actually, I mean, Trudeau uh, put $600 million into the nation CBC, Canada Broadcasting Corporation, yeah. to be able to, if you will, dictate what messages people are going to see. If that's coming from your prime minister, okay, we have a real problem. So when you add up all of these little things that are really clear, yeah. then you should really question what kind of ethical system are we actually being involved in? Why, why does the prime minister of the country walk out of parliament? Um, there, there are just so many questions that people don't really want to take a look at, and yet we need the people to look at these situations so that they can completely come and unite with the rest of Canada, because I think that we're showing solidarity for the country, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you accept it, but at least at the very end of the day, be recognized of what's going to be taken away from you if yeah. you do nothing. Absolutely. Now you mentioned the, the Young Global Leaders Program for the World Economic Forum. I do think we need to talk about this for a little bit because it's always been sort of like the shadow government or, you know, it falls into the conspiracy theory uh, corner and things like that. And so I think we need to start digging a little bit. And when you actually look and start digging a little bit, you do find that there are a lot of things that really stick right into your face of what, for example, the founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus, Klaus Schwab, um, <clears throat> said in his nicely German accent with English, where you definitely hear where he's coming from. And he talks about that he knows half of the government now, of the cabinet in Canada. They've infiltrated many of those areas. And it's not just Trudeau. So there is Kurtz, there is Merkel, there uh, Putin was part of it. So there's a whole number of, of leaders. And while I do not want to venture off in conspiracy theory, I do want to say one thing, though. You know, we talk a lot about conspiracy. Well, we don't 
don't on the program, but there's a lot of talk in general. So anything that's even remotely pointing to who really runs the show is put in either the Nazi corner or in the conspiracy uh, theory corner. And the thing with theories is this. If something is just a theory, you don't really have to be afraid of it because it's not true. You're only afraid of something when you know that there is something that might actually hurt you that, that has some truth to it. So I think we all need to start thinking about this um, a, a little bit more. And there are um, uh, clips of Klaus Schwab, which are now publicly available, where he talks about the role of the World Economic Forum and how they've put their leaders, so to speak, the same Cotter, the same type of thinking that come out of there. And actually, even if, if you don't look at it from a conspiracy theory, I mean, I know I went to grad school, I went to business school, anyone who goes to a certain school has a certain alma mater. You live by it. That's just what it is. You have a certain way of looking at things, a certain view of seeing things, and a certain way of approaching things. And I think those are the things we need to keep in mind. I also want to talk about a little bit about he wrote the book The Great Reset which interestingly enough was published well it's called COVID-19 and the Great Reset but what's really interesting is it was published on July 9 2020. Now for anyone who's written a book you know that we started the lockdowns in March sort of on a full on a full scheme 2020 so what's the likelihood that someone writes a book and gets it published in three months sort of with this lay laying out this grand plan of a reset just in three months not possible now we do need a reset and i want to talk a little bit about that but a different type of reset right richard we need to talk about more in terms of what the world really needs, none of the fake reset that's kind of like as fake as the fiat monetary system, which by the way has the same thinkers or the same spirits of the program that come up with the great reset of the World Economic Forum. So we need more of a reset that really is in tune of divine principles of restoring the sacred in everything that lives and following more an order that is based on sort of universal principles. So I want to talk about that because you, and I want to bring James on here too, you are underwriting a United Nations petition to make the planet sustainable. Highlight the key points for us. Um, well, I, I'd like to first say that based on the world, um, we can do a lot better with alternative strategies that don't encourage greed, corruption, and manipulation. And in fact, my process in my book is all about time. And time is fully transparent. We can't uh, abuse the system of time. Trust is the result of that transparency. Equality is the result of that, e that, that trust. And then true democracy is when people start to truly recognize that yes, we do all have a voice and, and it's not bought in by the typical lobbyist. So when we're looking at uh, the areas that are, if you will, most important, there are so many people out there that have grounded themselves into becoming a part of a new system. So for example, and this is not new to people, the education system needs to be dramatically reformed. We're teaching our children things from a hundred years ago and trying to make them apply in, in, in our current day-to-day -day role. We have healthcare issues around the world and, and, and they're even growing you know, much more exponentially, okay, because of what's going on from the standpoint of the, the, the COVID. In fact, um, from a financial perspective in the United States, there was an insurance company that stated that there are 40% more deaths Okay, well, if that's 40% more deaths in the United States, that means insurance companies are going to pay out a lot more money. We're going to destabilize our financial system. Yeah, very and, much likely going to crumble. Yeah, and, and James is an example. Okay, he and I have gotten together because I really appreciated James's expertise and first and foremost in, in soil remediation because James has been able through his profession, and by the way, James's last name is Fuller. And he told me a little while back that his great uncle, I believe it was, was uh, one of my personal favorite motivators, uh, Buckminster Fuller. 
And one of the quotes that Buckminster yep. suggested was that when something becomes obsolete, build a better plan. <clears throat> And that's what James is doing. James is building a better, a better plan for soil remediation and also understanding what we need to do about our oceans. Yeah, let's, chem- let's talk yeah. about this for a second, James. Can you, is your internet connection stable enough? Can you talk about this? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, the soil remediation, I'm working with Ali Kabadi in Turkey and uh, South Africa with Henry, and he's got a big farm down there. He's testing all of these methods of Ali Kavadi. I'm getting import uh, jurisdiction for bringing it to the United States, and uh, this will take care of the artificial fertilizer. We'll get it off the market, which is causing the pollution uh, in the Mississippi Delta, it's like 4,000 square miles of farmland that is draining into the Mississippi Delta, drains out to the Gulf of Mexico, causing blooms of algae blooms. They sink to the bottom, the bacteria eats it and uses up all the oxygen, everything dies. This year alone, it was 8,000 square miles. This is happening all around the world. and. Um, the problem is the artificial fertilizers. So we have an alternative for this now, and uh, we're going to bring it to market just as quickly as we can get it there. And Ali's ready to uh, supply. So all I'm waiting on is University of LSU to lab test a sample I've gotten from him. Mm-hmm. And when I get that back, I'll be good to go. That sounds awesome. Now, do you, you mentioned to me at the beginning of the show, when we were not on air yet, that you wanted to be called an underwriter of the United Nations petition. So we have a few minutes left. I want to talk a little bit more about the petition, where people can go. Why did you do it? So you said you're all in. Why, James? I'm all in. Um, John Rose Bush's energy venue is like the T-Rex downtown New York. Have you ever seen a T-Rex? down down New York? No. So this is a big thing. It's going to stabilize power generation for 200 years in the future, 300 years. Um, It's that powerful. Uh, It's inexpensive. It's good for the people. And this is why we're bringing it to the people. Yeah. Uh, They need to know about it. They need to know it exists. United Nations blocking it. We were written to President Biden, he's blocking it. Other uh, venues are blocking this. So look, I'm a logical thinker. I know the future resides in change. And we have to make these changes immediately, not tomorrow. Not, uh, we should have done it 20 years ago. But um, this, this is very immediate. It needs to happen very quickly. So that seems to me here, though, that's that's a little bit of the difference because there, you know, change has been talked a lot about. Um, actually, even through the World Economic Forum, they talked a lot about change, but nothing ever happened. So with your United Nations petition, what do you think is going to happen, and how many people do we do you need to support this? And then, what do you see the United Nations do about it? We need millions. We need billions of people. This is for the people. It's by the people, and it's with the people, and that's what's being blocked. The the people aren't getting the information that tells them that this is a correct pathway. They're saying our pathway is incorrect. Well, what really truly is incorrect is 2,755 billionaires on the planet that are doing what? Using up resources. It takes three, three times the amount to maintain one billionaire. Multiply that by 2,755, and you're using 1.7 Earths. Well, by the way, we only have one Earth, okay? So that's insanity. We just ran into the world of insanity as a species if we keep on this pathway. So This is logic, it's yeah. just logic. So then is the United Nations the right way to go about uh, well, they have a lot of the ears and the eyes of the people. And if uh, Mr. Gutierrez would bring this before the nations, 
he would be making the right move. That's all I can say. And it would be the right thing to do. So we do actually have a short video of the petition and I hope we can play it. Welcome to the UN Petition for a Sustainable Planet. Introducing John Rosebush of WDC Power and his challenge to the UN. James Boyd Fuller and his World Alliance for Planetary Health, author of Out of Balance. And Richard M. Kernicki, author of The Capitalist Worst Nightmare Come True, The Crucifixion of Capital. These three are working together to create a sustainable planet for our collective future. Hi, my name is Richard Kernicki, the author of The Capitalist's Worst Nightmare Come True, The Crucifixion of Capital. My book introduces a concept called time equity, and it's an interesting concept because its purpose is to eliminate capitalism and replace it with something that I think is much more important, and that's time. So we want to introduce time equity to the world to make the world a lot more efficient. Even though the book has the word crucifixion in the title, it's not really about the crucifixion. The book is really about the resurrection and the unleashing of humanity's potential. Why do we need to unleash humanity's potential? Well, that's really simple because the problems that we have on this planet are not being solved. The powers that be seem to ignore the real issues and they protect their interests and their rights by not being open-minded to other possible solutions. For example, I work with John Rosebush, the originator of WDC Power, and John's got an energy invention that'll reduce the cost of power and clean up the whole business of power at a very, very low cost. We've got James Boyd Fuller, the author of a book called Out of Balance that talks about soil remediation fertilizers and their chemical fertilizers and their effects on the water systems and and the oceans and without oceans and clean water and plankton humanity cannot continue to survive hello i'm james boyd fuller uh, president and ceo of world alliance of planetary health my message today is um of most importance to all people on this planet. Uh, we must now produce something viable which will give us direction uh, and pathway which is clear and concise, uh, science-based and uh, solution-based. So John Rosebush has done this um, I'm backing him because he has the most positive solution going forward for the next 200 years. If we continue on our pathway today, uh, we're going to destroy what we have as a civilization. Hello, my name is John Rosebush. I'm the founder, the CEO, and the president of the Worldwide Development Corporation. Over the last 16 years, the Worldwide Development Corporation has created a new energy invention that has the capability to power this planet many, many times over, for a fraction of the cost of any energy generation technology that exists today. And it doesn't consume resources. About a year and a half ago, I was invited to the United Nations, where I gave a small speech. When I got back, I realized all it was was politics. So what did I do? I created a United Nations challenge. And that challenge states that if the Worldwide Development Corporation cannot prove from the materials that already exist 
that we can power this plant 15,000 times over for 5% or less of the cost of wind and solar. We'll give up the rights to the new energy invention. 99% of the engineers in this world would consider that a miracle. So, Secretary General contacted me about two to three months ago. I sent him the United Nations Challenge, along with a letter that he requested that I send to him. He was supposed to send that letter to all the member countries of the United Nations. And I was hoping by now that the United Nations or a group of countries would take on this challenge. Not asking for money and uh, creating a challenge that most people think, would think would be impossible should be an easy thing. Because what does this uh, new energy invention do? It solves almost all of the United Nations and climate change problems around the world. So what am I asking here? This petition is to put pressure on the United Nations to take on this challenge. Nobody's asking for money. We're asking for patent protection. And why do we want patent protection? Because this new energy invention belongs to the people. So please sign this petition and let's put some pressure on the United Nations where they have no choice but to take on this challenge. I believe right now special interest is blocking this. Let's put pressure on the United Nations. Please sign this challenge. It's going to change the world for the better. Back John Rose Bush uh, in his power generation venue um, for the future. Doing for the people, by the people, with the people. My main objective in the future is to um, do more for agriculture, um, more for the oceans. How are we going to do this? Uh, there's a man called Ali Kavadi. Uh, he's, he's internationally known for his uh, preparedness in uh, humic type uh, soil response, putting life back into soils. Uh, this is what he's doing. This is I'm backing him. Dr. Henry Wayana uh, is in South Africa uh, developing the process. And soon we'll have a fertilizing agent which uh, uses microbials um, to beef the soils up, to release mineral bases and uh, nutrients out of the soils. Much like uh, how an artificial fertilizer would do, but it's not artificial, it's live. And uh, it's made from coal. So. I'm backing it. I'm 100% uh, for it because it's uh, it's non-polluting. Um, as people may know, uh, we get things into the soil that leach out. They're called nitrates, and when they leach out, they go into waterways. And when they go into waterways, they end up in the oceans. They cause algal blooms, and those algal blooms die. They drop to the bottom. They cause hypoxic zones which are dead zones. Everything dies down there. And um, there's no oxygen. So I'm backing a pathway which uh, presents this new uh, pathway for um, soil conditioning and agriculture. And uh, Sam and Henry and uh, Mr. Cavati are working to get this uh, ironed out how we will do it large scale. We have some really serious issues that haven't been addressed and usually the reason for those issues is the lack of funding or the lack of money. And that's why I would suggest the option to look at the opportunity to create something that doesn't have anything to do with money and yet at the same time, time is transparent. Time Transparency builds trust, trust builds equality, and equality builds a true democracy. Please join John and James and I as we have a challenge before the UN that they seem to be, relatively speaking, ignoring us to talk about the problems of humanity and the solutions that we've put together. 
And yet, at the same point in time, what we would also really like you to do is sign a petition that will help us move from the bottom up. Since the top-down approach doesn't really work well, let's use the bottom-up approach. And I invite you, your friends, your families, your associates, please find the UN challenge, please find the petition, and please sign the petition so that we can move to change the way this world works before it's too late. Hey, thank you so much. I do want to invite all of you, go to our Facebook page. You can get a link to the petition. You can see it there. We also put it in the edited version and I would invite you to become part of this and really support it. So we looked at the past, we looked at the present. Now let's come together and kind of look at the future of where we're gonna go. I think that would really be the right approach. Thank you so much for all of you for coming on. James, good luck in the Gulf of Mexico. I know you're on the vessel. Thank you. Good night, everyone. And uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Have a good night.